Hello, and thank you for sharing some time with the National Small Business Association to talk about where we are in the coronavirus crisis. Today, we'll be providing a status update on the various small business relief provisions, discussing the recent PPP loan forgiveness guidance, touching on employer requirements and rules under COVID, and where we go from here. Our goal today is to provide an update and, most important, to take your questions. I'm Molly Day, here with NSBA, a staunchly nonpartisan organization uh, fighting for your small business. Today, we're going to talk with NSBA President Todd McCracken, Marilyn Landis, owner of Basic Business Concepts, Inc., a company providing CFO-level advice to small firms, and Keith Ashmus, a leading employment law expert. Todd, Marilyn, and Keith, thank you for joining us today. I'd like to first start with a quick recap of where things stand today in, economic, in today's economic outlook, um, including state and federal reopening plans, uh, the latest round of funding for the PPP and idle lending programs. And for that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to you, Todd. Thank you, Molly, and thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, I, I'm sure there's a little bit of weariness of, of uh, COVID-19 webinars, but uh, we found the key really for most small companies is information. They need to find out what's going on, what's likely to happen, and determine how they can plan for their business's survival and ultimate success. So um, thanks for taking the time for, to do that. Uh, with us today. Um, and we're going to allow plenty of time at the end for some questions. Well, I shouldn't say plenty because I'm inevitably there'll be more questions than we can answer, but we're going to allow more time to listen to you than just to hear us talk. Um, and before I forget uh, here at the top, I want to make sure that people understand that we really need feedback. If you'll go to our uh, COVID-19 uh, page within our website, which is at nsba.biz, um, you'll find tools for you to give us feedback. So we want to both know what your experience has been, but also we want to know uh, uh, what recommendations you have for how we can move forward uh, beyond the position where we're in right now. But the state of play is, is, is I, this does feel a little bit like a pivotal moment. Uh, some states are beginning to reopen gradually. Um, we're seeing, I think, for the first time uh, really across the country, uh, uh, a, a shift in the curve of the disease itself, uh, except for a few uh, cities. So more and more people are looking to see how we can we can get the economy moving again. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more coming up. Uh, one of the bridges, the really important bridges that we've used to get to this point and keep as many businesses intact as possible is the pay Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and uh, it has evolved rather dramatically. As you, most of you know, there was the $350 billion uh, initial injection of, 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 of monies for that program, uh, most of which can be forgiven and turned into grants. Um, and what we saw initially was small companies that were a little bit bigger had their decks in a row faster, and they, and they were sort of preferred partners in many cases of some of some of the banks, so they were able to get their loans in first. And a lot of our smallest members were saying, hey, I haven't got an answer yet. Uh, that really has changed. Uh, and the first uh, uh, 10 days of the program, pretty much all the money was given out in the first tranche and the average loan size was over $200,000. Since the funds got replenished, some new rules were put into place, but more importantly, the companies that were left on the sidelines finally got some attention. And now the average loan size is down to about $70,000. Dramatic, uh, uh, change in the kind of companies that got that that funding. Um, and uh, so we think that's really good. Um, but there's sort of two things that have weighed on people since then is that program was designed back in really early to mid March, uh, at a time when we really thought that this, uh, this crisis that, that uh, or hoped, and a lot of people thought this crisis would be, you know, this a temporary shutdown and then a restart. And so the idea was how can we get a few weeks of of, uh, of uh, payroll money into the hands of small businesses so they keep it together, so they keep the employees together until we can restart this thing. Well, of course, that really has not ha been how things have played out. So while the PPP program has been, a, I think, a success for what it is, as we move forward, we realize it by no means meets the needs of all companies, and it doesn't meet the needs of, of the economy moving forward from this point really at all. So we're, we're, we are in that mode of piecing together what, what we do uh, moving forward. But thinking about that program, because we have had uh, uh, over 4 million companies that have gotten those loans, 
uh, we have only just in the last few days gotten some rules from uh, from the federal government for how they can get forgiveness for those loans, the actual steps, and the actual procedures. Um, unfortunately, it, it does provide uh, some clarity, but does not provide all the flexibility that we had wanted because we had really hoped that the eight week period uh, during which uh, expenditures can be forgiven under this program, we had really hoped there could be some flexibility in, in the start of that program, uh, that, that eight week period. And it's a little bit uh, that I think Marilyn might talk about. Uh, there's not nearly enough. Um, so, so, so really, that's that's I would say that that's a mixed bag. Um, but our attention really now is turning to growing the economy and, and keeping small business together. So we've got to think about what are some longer term programs that can help the small business community specifically, A, and B, what are some overall strategies that can be employed to get the economy overall growing at a faster pace so that it doesn't need government injections of dollars as we've done so far. So, uh, I, I, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit more later also. I'm going to get to some principles that NSBA has developed for how we can grow the economy and what are the, what are the important steps we need to take in the next few weeks. Um, but I'm going to save that because I just want to tease that out to people thinking about that so you can ask your questions in that regard and also be providing some feedback to us. But right now I want to make sure we have some plenty of time to hear from other really top-notch speakers about some things that are probably a little bit more pressing for your companies. So that's it for Great. now. Thanks, Hud. And I, I am seeing questions that are starting to come in. I, I, if I could ask everybody to use the Q&A tab, if you scroll either to the top or the bottom, depending upon how you, you're watching this, um, if you click on the Q&A button uh, and then type in your questions there, and we'll get to those all at the end. So um, please keep them coming in. We're keeping a good tally and we'll get to all of those toward the end of our conversation. Um, if you could avoid sending out the chat, that would be really helpful. Um, just so we can keep it all on the Q&A, that would be much appreciated. So um, as Todd mentioned, Mentioned, we'd like to delve a bit more into the uh, lending programs. Um, Marilyn, you're our, our resident SBA lending uh, program expert. Um, can you walk us through the PPP and IDLE programs and share with us what you're telling your clients on accessing um, this kind of assistance through SBA? So much. And as Todd had said, the expectations have changed significantly since mid-March. The realities have changed. So what businesses thought they needed and what we were expressing to the Hill that we needed has changed. Uh, the bill originally said that eligibility for forgiveness would be available up to 100% of the loan amount for loan funds that were used for payroll over an eight-week period. Didn't specify how those proceeds would have to be used, but did say if it was used for payroll, then it would be forgiven. And that any amounts not forgiven would be uh, required to be repaid if they had not been forgiven by the end of the year over a maximum of 10 years with an interest rate of 4%. So the original intent was, if you use it for payroll, it's forgiven. If you use it for other legitimate business purposes, it'll roll over into a low interest long-term loan. Significant changes began to happen, and the first one was on April 3rd, when SBA and Treasury jointly issued rules introducing how the program would be crafted. What they did for the first time was introduce the forgiveness criteria. So rather than payroll is eligible for forgiveness, they crafted the criteria with a formula that said the maximum forgiveness would be a minimum of 75% of proceeds had to be used for payroll and no more than 25% maximum for loan interest, rent, and utilities. Well, if you think about that, that equals 100%. So the natural question that raises in your mind is, what's going to be left to be unforgiven. So many people approach this loan with that idea. If I spend it, the 75-25 rule, it'll all be forgiven. Then on April 4th, we got a new edition, and this is for the first time the rules were published, April 14th, for those that were sole proprietors, self-employed, or single-member LLCs. The difference in those rules where they were different from the employer was that it was based on the net profit, the, specifically the net profit on found on Schedule C of the federal tax return, which is what these entities would have filed. And if that net profit was less than zero, they were ineligible. The other piece was they have a maximum loan for 10 weeks, but they're only forgiven for eight weeks unless they have interest or rent or interest rent or utilities. And since many places of these businesses are home-based, that didn't give them the availability 
of the additional funds to be forgiven. Companies were struggling to fit into those best, into those definitions of what they would be forgiven. The expectation was we borrowed, they were often told borrow as much as you can, be sure you get in there quick to get it, this is gonna help you through. And many businesses really felt this is what they needed. And then this period of lockdown began to expand. The needs started to change. The expectations of their customers started to change. So there was a real anticipation of what the forgiveness application would look like, what that finally would be there for. And it came out on Friday of last week on May 15th. For those of you who are listening who are self-employed and file a Schedule C, pay special attention to line nine on page five. Most of the rest of the application won't directly apply to you, but you will have to work your way through all of the application. But what changed with the forgiveness? The 7525 rule is still the same, but the forgiveness was is able to be reduced. And they had talked about this, and we now we know what the formula is for that. So you may have spent 75% on payroll and 25% on rent and utilities, but if you have had a reduction in full-time equivalents or a reduction in the salaries you're paying your people, you will see a reduction in the amount of forgiveness. So let me talk about that because that's significant because many companies who have been trying to adjust to the bill and follow it now have to look at this new criteria. First of all, when you originally applied for a payroll protection loan, you did a body count. If you had 200 full-time employees, this is an example right in the regs, 200 full-time employees and 50 part-time, you counted as 250 people. When they started talking about full-time equivalent, that means the looking at the hours. So you may have, that, let's use that same example of 250 people. You have 200 people full-time, 50 people who each work um, 10 hours a week. It's going to take four of those to equal one full-time person. So the original application was based on body count. Now we need to do the calculations for full-time equivalent. So unlike the expected bulk calculation, I've been on many webinars, I've listened to lots of experts talk over the last eight weeks, and there was an expectation it would be a bulk calculation. Take all your employees at the onset of this, do a calculation for full-time equivalent, take their hours, divide it by a 40-hour week, and you have full-time equivalents, and then we'll do this bulk calculation at the end. We were often told it won't matter if Tom quits and you hire Susie, and that bulk calculation led into that thinking. What is different in the forgiveness is the calculation for full-time equivalent is by employer, is by employee. So you're gonna to have to go to each employee and calculate the full-time equivalent of their hours by employee. And it's also gonna use 40 hours as a standard. Some states use 30. So you're gonna require to use the federal standard for 40 hours. So what you'll need to do is first go back and calculate the full-time equivalent for when you started and they've given you three options in the forgiveness application for what you choose to pick as your benchmark. You can use February 15th of 2019 to June 30th of 2019, last year in other words, or you can use January 1 of 20 for this year through February 29th of 20 this year, this year, or if you're a seasonal employer, you can use a trailing 12 months. So what I'm telling my clients to do, if they're not a seasonal employer, do the full-time equivalent calculation going for last year, April or February to June, and this year, January through February. So see which is the one that's more realistic of the world they're in right now. Then they need to do a new calculation by employee of the employees who are working for them during the eight week period that's covered that they're seeking forgiveness. The difference with this calculation, it's capped at one. What does that mean? Let me give you an example. Overtime doesn't count. For most businesses, if Susie calls off sick, Tom offers to work a few extra hours to make that up for them. So if Tom normally works 40 hours, you divide it by 40, he's one full-time equivalent. But if Susie's off sick and he steps up and ends up working 50 hours to cover her time, 50 hours divided by 40 is 1.25. He's the equivalent of one and a quarter people. He's capped at one. So that normal expansion of time filled with overtime won't count the way it's cur currently being calculated. Second, then you have to calculate uh, the average weeks during the eight-week period. Same calculation, same capping at one for full-time equivalent. So you measure that whatever you picked as your benchmark against the full-time equivalent for the eight weeks of where you were covered. If there is a reduction in full-time equivalents, then there will be a reduction in your overall forgiveness. So for example, you had a $100,000 loan, you spent 75% of it on payroll and 25% on other allowable expenses, but 
you had a reduction in your full-time equivalents and it's down, it's only 90% of where you started, you only get 90% of the forgiveness. So you've spent the 7525, but you only get $90,000 as forgiveness instead of 100,000. So there's a lot, this is as complicated as a tax return. So be patient as you go through this. I said to my clients when I sent out the directions, I said, keep in mind, I'm learning this too. Don't fire the messenger. There is a safe harbor. If the full-time equivalents are have all been returned by June 30th, and this is what's different. It's not using the benchmark you picked. It's using one set by law or set by the, the regulation. The benchmark full-time equivalents you had at February 15th of 20, if you return to that same number as February 15th of 20, by June 30th, then you can get 100% forgiveness. It gives you some time to try to ramp back up to where you were before. There's a second test for forgiveness. You can have your, tip, your forgiveness reduced if your full-time equivalents have reduced. You can also have it reduced or further reduced if your average wages have been reduced. So you have to compare the period of wages from, not the one you pick, this one's set for you, Compare the wages from January of 20 through March of 20, the average wage, and compare it to the eight-week period you're covered. And the eight-week period begins with your disbursement of your loan funds for eight weeks. If there has been a reduction of more than 25% in the salary you're paying your employees, your forgiveness will be proportionate. And we don't have enough time in this seminar to go through the complicated formula. If you want to see it, it's on page seven and eight. And that tells you exactly how that reduction works. So those were some things that were in the forgiveness that we hadn't expected. There is also a safe harbor on this one. It's the same if you've restored the wages to at least 75% of what they were on, in February by June 30th, and you can re get the 100% forgiveness. So many businesses may find themselves waiting to file their forgiveness until they get to June 30th so they could document that they have met the uh, safe harbors. So let me wrap up with this, Molly, because I think it's important. Why has this SBA loan program had so much headline? Why have there been so much controversy? Why have there seemed to be so many revisions and so many rule changes? First of all, it's a small business, and we are the favorites of, of the public, so that's a good reason. Second, there was an honest attempt to rush this new program out and to try to move, move all the obstacles that normally cause an SBA loan to take too long. However, yes, and I was an SBA lender for years, regular SBA pro programs have lots of rules, all right? But these rules have a cumulative result of 70 years of fine tuning delivery to the small business market and excluding entities that are deemed not to need taxpayer loans. So that's where the history of where all of those rules have come from. In an effort to get the money out quickly, uh, the payroll protection guidelines waived most of this body of rules in part or in full. So for example, one that's hit the headlines a lot are people who received money who are now being told they probably shouldn't have, they weren't entitled to it. And that was the way the SBA's affiliation rule, which says, let's look at the sum of all the companies that have common ownership and maybe when we're done, we've got a big company. So the affiliation rules in some cases were limited or they were waived as they were for religious entities. Why is that important? We may think this business looks like a small business on Main Street and we discover it's really a subsidiary of Amazon. So there was a history in SBA of trying to identify those things before the loans were made and somebody objected. Borrowers also for this, for this were the first time in all my lending history were ever actually asked to self-certify the information they were submitting. So we had borrower self-certifying versus lender verifying. So many people in the rush to put information in were used to their lenders checking them. So I often would get from somebody, well, the bank said it was okay. We found out later it wasn't okay, but the bank was told they didn't have to worry about it. They had to get it through. It was the responsibility of the borrower to certify. And in all the complexity of rules coming out, no wonder there were a lot of mistakes made. Also, there was an inclusion of entities, of entities that could get payroll protection who previously had been ineligible for SBA, such as nonprofits, gaming institutions, casinos, and so forth. So there had to be rules written for how you handle and nonprofits, religious nonprofits. So a lot of rules had to come out of that that didn't have 70 years worth of history to support them. And lastly, the personal guarantee was waived. Why was that important? It often was the biggest thing a lender had to say, who and what resources are available for this borrower. 
So that's, I think, one reason why there has been so much controversy and so much confusion. It's because we're trying to do something from scratch, literally, in an effort to get the resources out to small business. Lastly, Molly, you asked me to touch a little bit on the idle loan. Not as much there, but it's equally important. Currently, until the backlog of existing idle loans are caught up, and remember the SBA is doing all the work on this. This is not through the lenders. So anyone on this call has a question on the idle loan, can't call your bank, you have to call SBA. So SBA has put a pause on new applications until they get caught up on what they already have, unless you are an agribusiness or a farm, because they were not open to this program before. So if you have applied for an idle loan, even if you applied back in March or beginning of April, you should have received the advance. And as the slide indicates, it's not the 10,000 talked about, it's 1,000 per employee, but that should have arrived in your account. SBA doing preliminary, SBA started doing preliminary, preliminary underwriting on the information you submitted on the application. Based on that, many of my clients have started receiving decline letters with instructions on how they can appeal. Some are getting approvals, may or may not be for the amount they'd hoped for. Most are getting requests for more information because particularly the latter applications in the idle loan were streamlined and simplified to get the system moving faster. And now SBA needs more information to determine, because remember this is an economic injury loan, disaster loan. So they're trying to determine the economic injury that you experienced. So if you need the loan, if you have vendor expenses you have to pay, if there's insurance you need to pay, Oh, by the way, the COVID rules changed the way we have to remodel your facility or put up barriers or get special cleaning done. Those are all legitimate reasons for an economic hardship that's caused by the disaster. So make your case. And when the SBA calls, make your case that you want that idle loan because it is a low interest rate loan, as you see on the screen, and it can be for an amount up to 150000 This could make the difference between you surviving this or not. And Molly, that's a very fast recap, and I'll answer any questions during the Q&A that you will have me answer. Great. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, that, that's very helpful. And, and I do want to um, just remind folks, if you have questions, please input them through the Q&A portal. Um, I think we've already got 54 questions, so we may not get through all of them, but we'll do our best to respond um, following the, the uh, webinar if, uh, as we can. Um, with that, let me turn it over to um, Keith. Uh, can you walk us through the key changes folks need to be aware of uh, in this new normal? Specifically, what do you need to be aware of when it comes to employee pay, unemployment, FMLA, um, and, and what should employers be thinking about in terms of reopening? And with, with that in mind, um, if you can be as brief as possible with that huge... <laughs> huge sure, 10 minutes. Uh, uh, that should cover everything. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Yeah, I wanted to, to, to start with the family's uh, first coronavirus uh, Coronavirus Relief Act, because uh, that is something that a number of employers who uh, closed early uh, and are now picking up again uh, have not had to deal with, because that act became effective on April 1st and was not retroactive. So a lot of employers who reduced their uh, employees because they were told to shut down in March uh, have not had to deal with that because they haven't had any employees. So uh, the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act has two major parts. One is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, which provides two weeks of paid sick leave for specified reasons. And then the Emergency Family Medical Leave Expansion Act, which provides 12 weeks, 10 of which are partially paid uh, for a particular purpose, which I'll get to. Uh, the six purposes that you get paid leave for uh, are that you're subject to a federal, state, uh, or local uh, isolation or quarantine order. Uh, that may be coming off because many of the states and localities are now have changed their orders to strong recommendations. And a strong recommendation would not necessarily qualify uh, someone for relief uh, for this two weeks of pay. Second thing is that they've been advised by a healthcare provider uh, to quarantine or isolate. Third thing is that they're experiencing symptoms and are awaiting a confirmed diagnosis. Uh, fourth is they're caring for an individual who's covered by one of the foregoing reasons. Um, fifth is that they're caring for a child uh, whose school or place of care or child care provider is unable to 
be open or provide care because of reasons related to uh, coronavirus. And the sixth is sort of a catch-all if there's anything similar to that. Now, um, the compensation is different depending on what those reasons are. For the, if you're self-quarantining, uh, kept in by a, uh, an order, uh, or you're having your own symptoms reviewed, uh, you're entitled to your full regular rate uh, up to a maximum of $511 a day uh, or $5,110 for the 10 days in the two week period. Uh, if you're caring for somebody who is in one of those categories, you're only entitled to the two thirds of that. And if you're caring for your own child, uh, you're also entitled to just the 10 days uh, or for the two thirds of that. Now, uh, the Family Medical Leave Expansion Act uh, expands the Family and Medical Leave Act reasons to cover that um, so that employees uh, who otherwise uh, would not have anything paid and are just and are caring for their own uh, children are entitled to uh, this 12 weeks of pay. The first two weeks are unpaid and the last 10 are paid at two thirds of the rate. But when you combine the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act with the Emergency Family Medical Leave Expansion Act, you get 12 weeks uh, of paid potential paid leave. Now, uh, it's important to take a look at the language because it requires that the uh, school be closed for reasons related to COVID-19. And as we approach the end of the school year, what that means is that if the school is closed because it's closed and the year's over, uh, you're not entitled to compensation for the time you're spend, uh, spending taking care of your child. School ends um, the week after Memorial Day. After that, uh, you're just kind of on your own and you're not entitled to paid leave because the school is not closed because of COVID-19. It's closed because it's closed. Uh, you can also, however, uh, use the fact that your child's scheduled camp is closed because of COVID-19 as a basis for receiving uh, compensation uh, for that. So um, again, uh, complicated, but um, it is something that is designed to provide compensation for uh, individuals who have a job but can't work it because of reasons relating to COVID-19. Now, um, it's uh, also the case that as an employer, uh, you have to pay this, but it's very nice that the uh, government has provided a way for you to get your money back uh, that you spend on uh, compensating your employees, and that's through a credit against your share of the uh, withholding tax, Social Security uh, tax, so that 7.65% that you pay, not the 7.65% that your employees pay. Um, but your uh, portion of that, uh, you can take a credit for, uh, and it's a refundable credit. So if a certain circumstances work out that, uh, say, by in December, you have a whole raft of people who are entitled to paid uh, sick leave or paid time off, uh, and you don't have enough left in your uh, payments for uh, withholding pay, uh, you can still take that um, credit and it's refundable, so you can uh, ask the government to write a check to you. So it, uh, it does provide for full compensation for whatever you pay uh, on behalf of your employees. Now we're also uh, coming into a situation where many employers are trying to get their employees back and they're hearing that uh, the employees uh, really would like to stay home and keep collecting unemployment uh, and getting the extra $600 uh, that is provided uh, for them. And the uh, response of you know, many employers is, well, we'd really like to work with you, but we need you back. And if you, we have a job for you, and if you don't come back, uh, we have no choice but to let the state know that uh, you're turning down work that's available and the employee would not be entitled to uh, unemployment compensation. And frequently that's um, what's required to get, uh, to get them back to work. Uh, and up until the time that, um, uh, these orders changed from being actual orders to recommendations. Employees were being clever and saying, well, uh, you know, I'm just going to take a trip to Michigan and 
I'm under a quarantine order uh, because of the travel restrictions that I have to self quarantine for 14 days after I come back. Well, now that those um, orders are no longer orders, but strong recommendations, uh, that excuse for not coming back to work uh, may not uh, may not hold. Um, there is a requirement under the Family Medical Leave Act that employees get uh, restored to their positions. Uh, that is weakened for employers with fewer than 25 employees. If their uh, position uh, doesn't exist and the employer makes an effort to uh, provide an equivalent position uh, and they spend a whole year um, trying to find an equivalent position. So uh, in most cases, that's a pretty cumbersome thing to do and keep track of. The other main issue with regard to reopening is uh, our employees going to be and, and customers for that matter, are their employees gonna feel safe in your business? And what happens if uh, they decide that you're not complying with safety guidelines? Well, OSHA has been um, active, not active enough, uh, according to the uh, AFL-CIO, but uh, they have provided uh, some guidance. The CDC has had, uh, had guidance. And uh, my suggestion would be that it's there's been enough publicity that failure to follow the CDC guidelines and uh, OSHA's uh, guidelines would be uh, a potential uh, leave for employer or potential excuse for employers to be uh, cited for failing to uh, meet the general duty standard, which requires employers to provide a safe workplace that's free of recognized hazards. Uh, those things that employers need to do are triple cleaning, enforcing separation, potential use of masks, depending on whether you can have sep you can have masks except in uh, enclosed offices, um, temperatures taken on a regular basis, self screening and verification that there are no symptoms. Um, all of that is designed to make things uh, easier for. Um, and safer for employees. Uh, OSHA last uh, Friday, I think, came out with uh, guidance which changed its rule. Uh, prior to that, they said that employers could just assume that if somebody got uh, COVID-19, they would be uh, treated as having gotten it someplace other than uh, employment. But uh, Friday, they said uh, the employers have to make an effort to determine the source of the infection of the employee. So uh, it's possible that an employer would find that uh, the employee got um, infected at work and therefore it would be recordable at work and the employee potentially could be um, receiving uh, workers' compensation. Um, I think that if the employer takes normal accepted uh, ways of going about uh, this new normal of cleaning and separation that the likelihood that an employer employee would be able to establish that the employer engaged in some kind of intentional tort that would um, deprive the employer of the immunity that's provided by workers compensation laws is pretty slight uh, given the nature of all of this but um, if employers simply disregard uh, the guidelines and instruct employees to uh, ignore uh, what is social distancing and don't wear masks and that kind of thing. I think that's asking for uh, for problems. And it raises the issue of the interrelationship between uh, these very considerable additional costs of reopening that employers are going to be uh, incurring by the triple cleaning and uh, sanitizing and providing the masks and providing sanitizing stations every place and uh, you know, what they're uh, allowed to use their uh, PPP money for. Um, but certainly the idle um, loan is is definitely uh, something to look forward to. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop and um, leave it open for the few more, uh, probably one or two extra questions besides the 58 we already had. Great. 
thanks, Keith. And that was that's an impressive amount of information in, in just about 10 minutes. Well, we, we really appreciate all your insight. Um, I'd like to turn it back to you, Todd, briefly, um, just for some final thoughts on what's ahead, how our business is feeling about reopening, uh, what kind of legislation is on the horizon, and about a quick wrap up before we uh, dive into all the questions that we have, which are now up at about 76. So um, you, you experts have your work cut out for you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Molly. We have a lot of questions. I'll be, I'll be, we'll be very brief. Yeah, looking ahead, you know, we're going to move away, I think, from the PPP idle format. People are going to get that figured out. They're going to apply for their forgiveness to the extent they can this year. And then we'll be looking to, you know, the economy to grow or not grow and what the future is going to hold. And I'd, I'd point you to a few things. One, uh, uh, they'll be returning to a, a lot of regulatory issues. Keith just outlined a lot of employment uh, issues that uh, employers are going to have to face. Uh, just this week, the White House issued an executive order, the president issued an executive order, uh, basically clearing the way for agencies to to promulgate new rules easing re regulatory restrictions on companies. So hopefully some of those will be really productive. We don't know what those are yet, um, but but they've cleared the path in the relative near term to begin some 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 regulatory rollback, which could be productive for lots of companies. Um, there still is talk about uh, the, the the finally pass, passing a uh, 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 an infrastructure bill in 2020. If that happens, that could provide an economic boon for lots of companies, even those not directly involved in the infrastructure projects. Um, we continue to hear discussion from uh, the Hill on a, on a, some sort of an employment tax credit, a dramatic expansion of what was already in in the PPP, which would allow companies to take a pretty large tax credit for for their employees based on a few criteria. And if it's not too too limiting, it could be a big help. But if it's not, if it is, if it is not also not too limited, it could also be extraordinarily expensive and really expand the deficit much beyond where we are now. Um, and then finally, I think what is on the minds of lots of companies, they turn to think about not just surviving, but succeeding and growing if the economy does reopen, is 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 still their liquidity and their credit markets. I mean, they're gonna to return to a situation where they've often depleted their cash reserves, even with the PPP. Um, they probably look a lot less appealing to a bank than they did before. So we need to think really creatively about how we create a lending environment where those companies can get the capital and the credit they need to grow. Um, so I, I would say those are a, a few of the things I think we, uh, are looking forward to in the next few months. In some ways, I think it is unfortunate that we are in election year because we're already seeing a lot of the uh, the partisanship that had not completely been put, put aside, but has overcome at least to pass some of these initial bills. A lot of that partisanship is re-emerging now and it's gonna be increasingly difficult to get consensus to pass new legislation as we get closer and closer to the November elections, unfortunately. So I would say that's the case of bad timing, but we're gonna keep pushing for these things. I do think the, the window has not closed. I don't wanna to be too pessimistic here, but, um, uh, but those are the things we're going to be looking for and trying to make sure that we maximize those opportunities for the small business community. But that's a big picture look. I think we have a lot of very specific questions, though, that I want to make sure we leave time for. So what should we talk about first? Great. Well, thanks for that, Todd. I think what we'll do is um, go through the, the Q&A questions as they came in. Um, I'll go ahead and read those off to our presenters, and um, then we'll have you all uh, take take the questions and and Feel free to pipe in uh, as as seems appropriate. Uh, let me go ahead and start with um, the first question: Is if a business received an idle advance grant of under ten thousand dollars and a PPP loan, is the maximum amount of forgiveness amount decreased by the amount of the advance? I'm assuming that's for me. That's for you. All right. Uh, if the advance loan was rolled into, if the money, depending on the bank and the way they, they did it, if they rolled it into the total loan, then of course you couldn't be held accountable for the payroll requirements against money that was not issued for that purpose. So you need to find out what your bank did originally, whether it rolled it in or not. Great, thanks Marilyn. The next question says, uh, wondering if there are substantive conversations about extending the payroll cycle that qualifies for the forgiveness equation. 
I'll try that one. The answer is yes, it needs to be done legislatively, um, but there are lots of bills that we have supported that would that would make give employers much more flexibility in when the eight-week period starts and uh, even, even expand it beyond eight weeks so that they can maximize the amount of forgiveness they get. The, 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 the eight-week uh, forgiveness period was envisioned in a different environment than what we've wound up with. Um, so it, what we've got doesn't really fit the situation we're in now, and we, and we need to modify it. But that's going to take an act of Congress. Uh, it's not something that uh, the agencies have the ability to do on their own. The one thing they did do on their own, and this probably is a other question that's coming that I'll go ahead and answer, is uh, it gave companies flexibility in terms of the payroll period following the disbursement of the loans. So the eight-week clock starts once you get the money, but if your payroll period isn't for another, say, six or eight days, you can begin it at that point, with the beginning of a new payroll period and roll it forward. So there's that much flexibility, but that's really all. Great. The uh, next question, and I'm not 100% sure what the, the question asker is, is getting at, but um, they say, are these loans for existing loan holders? Marilyn, any idea on that? Well, if, if the payroll protection, the, all the guidelines we went through, if you did not apply for a PPP loan at this point, and you go to a, if you still open, there's so many available, and you were to go apply, you would now be at the benefit of the rules that came out on the 3rd of April and the 2015th of April and so forth and into May. So you would have a full scope of knowing what you're getting into. Idle loans, they tell us, will eventually reopen again, so they will be available again. Uh, under the new guidance that's out there for those as far as the amounts that are available. As far as new programs, there are some new programs floating around like the Main Street program with a minimum loan of half a million dollars, but those are not fully deployed yet on the street. And I think uh, they may be asking about whether you need to be a customer of an existing customer of a oh. bank. You clearly don't have to be, and there are a number of new lenders getting into this, PayPal as an example. Um, is uh, is one one location where you can get uh, PPP money. And you're absolutely right, Keith, and that leads into what Todd was talking about, what the credit markets are going to look like in the future. So many new lenders came into this who have industry niches. PayPal, for example, is more familiar with the uh, that, that type of re more retail type stuff. So they may have an appetite to take risks that other lenders would not have. So I think that's something that will help the future if regulation doesn't exclude some of those new lenders from the small business marketplace in the future. Great, thank you. <laughs> Pardon me, the next question we've, uh, we've received a couple times, does PPP cover workman's comp insurance? Good question, good question. And that has been directed in guidance. Uh, if, there's a, if your state assesses a tax for workers' comp that you as the employer pay, that part can be included. So the best thing you need to do is check directly with your CPA, your state rules, and understand how your state, because that varies from state to state, handles what you pay as employer on workers' compensation. Great, thank you. The next question, we, we received several different versions of it. Um, so the, I'll try and combine those. Can PPP be used for bonuses for employees or for hero pay? Okay, nothing in the um, application says no. However, guidance generally says as the rules have come out, and for those of you who haven't been privy to having the rules drop in your inbox every time they change, we've had about 50 revisions, and some of those revisions have four or five or 20 pages behind them. So when I'm referring to guidance, I'm referring to that tomb of information. Uh, but the general guidance has been in the normal course of things, if you're paying somebody a little extra to get them to come back, um, and that would be okay. If you're going to do, a, have never done a bonus before and you're suddenly going to do an annual bonus all at one time, that would be questioned. What they are looking for, I'm told, Department of Justice is looking for irregularities that they see potential for fraud. So I think everybody just needs to keep in mind if it's a normal course of, course of business, I normally give bonuses. There would be no questions asked. If they feel it's meaningful to their time, document, document, document why you're doing it, why it's important, and then you're not just trying to maximize your forgiveness. Okay. The next question is, uh, can PPP be used for retro pay so we are within the eight-week parameter? And what part of payroll taxes are included in forgiveness? Well, as, as Todd had mentioned, the eight weeks is set. And by statute, 
by law, it says eight weeks. It didn't dictate by law when those eight weeks had to start. In when some of the banks were dragging their feet about getting money out, I think it was a well-intended regulation that says the money has to be dispersed within 10 days of the bank getting the approval. For many small businesses, that was not when they wanted it. They would have rather had it out a period of time when it better fit when they were gonna to get to reopen with their states. But it, you cannot go, what you can look at, what they're looking for is a payroll in the eight weeks that are covered. As Todd had mentioned, if your payroll doesn't nicely fall in those eight week tranches, it's when the payroll was incurred. So that payroll might get paid outside of the eight weeks, but, it, but part of it was for this eight weeks. And it's the same with rent and other things. You can't accelerate it into the period to get more expense in that period. But if it was incurred in that period, you can calculate the payroll for the eight weeks. Even if it, some of it was paid before you went into the eight weeks, some of it ends up, as long as it's all coming within the next cycle. Yeah. And the payroll tax that the employer pays is included in what right. counts. Right. right. Yeah, not what's withheld on the employee, but the what the employer pays, the employer portion. Right. And kind of touching on that tax piece, another question just came in that, that says there are a lot of conflicting interpretations of the taxable rules. Do you see these rules changing in a way that could negatively impact borrowers? Oh, I think what they're referring to is no. when it first came out, there were many of us who had a question about by IRS code, if a debt is forgiven, that's taxable income in the year in which it's forgiven. And they took care of that when they wrote the bill and said this would be excluded from that IRS code. Then there's another little code in the IRS that says, but if you have income that is not taxable, you can't put normal tax expense deductions against it. And that's the piece that's causing a lot of angst and heartburn right now. And we need some guidance on that from either IRS or the SBA to say either in IRS made the first pass and came out and said, no, that still holds that the money that you have forgiven, the normal expenses you would put against that payroll, payroll tax, lease, uh, rent, cannot be included when you do your taxes as tax deductions. So as I've said to all my clients, you track all of that very carefully because at the end of the year, when you give your information to your CPA to do your taxes, they're going to have to exclude those expenses that were paid for with the forgiveness money. That might change if there's pressure on the IRS to right. waive that part of the code. I mean, we've put a lot of pressure on them uh, to do so. They might change their interpretation, I think, uh, although I wouldn't put it more than 50-50. But I do think we have sufficient support in Congress. If there are more bills, I think there's a good chance we will get that fixed. But as things stand now, you should assume that expenses for which you get uh, forgiveness are not deductible as a business expense. Okay. Um, the next question, and this is something that we've heard from, from our members for some time, is that um, what's the criteria for how businesses were formed? Um, uh, they're hearing that a lot of businesses are not qualifying. Um, one in particular said that because their bank wasn't, or their account wasn't set up as a, as a business account, but more of a personal account, that um, uh, a bank wouldn't make the loan. Are you hearing anything like that, Marilyn? Molly, I have, and I've heard it directly from clients, but the biggest confusion came in in that the self-employed were eligible to apply a good week or more before the rules were written. Because they saw the money so quickly being depleted and my clients included were in line to get their applications in before the bankers saw the rules. So A, that was the first thing. And also keep in mind that many of these banks were deploying people who had never touched a loan before, had no idea what an SBA reg looked like, had no idea what this stuff was, trying to answer questions. And it was not uncommon for a client to field me answers they were getting sitting in their bank. And I could go to the head of that bank's SBA department and get the contrary answer because there was a lot of confusion over the self-employed. Also, because you're not eligible unless you show a profit, one of my clients is a single member LLC, significant company, and he used that one because it's a Schedule C and was deemed it was ineligible because he didn't show a profit that year and ended up getting a loan under another business that was less active because it showed a small profit. So there was a lot of confusion out there. The assumption was that self-employed or self-employed, that's not true. And there are some bigger businesses that can be single member LLCs filing a Schedule C you'd never recognize that entity as such if you were talking to them in any other conversation. 
So I understand the confusion Molly made, the banks were confused, and to this day, so some of them are still giving misinformation. Not but in the, mean to, but they are. And the law, literally the only criterion is that you be a small business, and there are definitions around that, but basically it's at least companies that have 500 fewer, fewer employees and plus some others, uh, and that you were in business on February 15th of this year. That's it. Right. Um, and, but all these new things are things that either there's confusion around or the regulators have imposed new restrictions that weren't envisioned in the original legislation. And if I may, Molly, this is something that's critical for all the listeners that are with us today to understand. Those things that were imposed by regulation can be changed by the regulator. Right. Now, occasionally Congress has to step up and pass another law to force the agency to do what Congress originally told them to do. And we may get to that point with some of these bailouts where there's enough pressure on our, on our elected officials to go to Treasury or whoever and say, we want you to do this. But Todd's absolutely right. A lot of this was set in regulation, and it's a matter of pushing for those regulations to change. And they have changed frequently. And not so, always for the better. Right. Now, a good example was the safe harbor that was just given for smaller businesses. Many of the folks who are with us right now may have had significant angst over whether or not they were entitled to the money, had they had sufficient economic damage. When they saw a lot of this press I know I was getting inundated with calls saying, am I going to be in trouble? Am I going to be in trouble? And that was a ruling that came out the very end of April that said there's a safe harbor. If the loan amount is under $2 million, it's deemed that the borrower submitted the information in good faith. I don't know if you borrowed $2 million and one that made you a villain, but somehow that was the way that was set. But you're right, Todd. Some of it has been safe harbors, and some of it has been more restrictive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question says, I'm using PPP for payroll only, not just, not 75%, but all of it. The application on line 10 is showing 75%. How do I get it all forgiven? Again, the law was written that you would, if you use it for at least, and the, reg, and the regs comply with it, they said forgiveness if it's payroll. The application says that you have to have at least 75%. I have not tried to put in more than 75% on the application, but you should be able to. There should be a way to override it because the rule reads at least 75%. If you have more, great. And I have clients who needed more because they need more, believe it or not, more employees because it's harder to function in this economy. So they're actually increasing and they're going to use all the money for that. And that was the intent of the regulation. So I think it's a matter of just having somebody help you with the form. Okay. Um, the next question is kind of a combined question. Uh, is there a limit on what utility can be paid? And can you use PPP funds to cover monthly IT costs? Well, you know, we have nothing officially written hard code, but the general guidance from everybody who has gotten information out of the SBA or the SBDCs is that telephone, internet, and those types of costs would be considered utilities. So what I have said to all of my clients, if you're going to need, if you don't need them, don't put them in. You don't have to put expenses that you don't want forgiven. So if you don't need, you don't put them in. But if you need them and just be prepared to document why they are the standard course of business for you. The cell phones for your kids, probably not. But though, if it's your main course of business and you're dependent on those communication lines, those internet lines, absolutely. And then just document it. The other thing too, Molly, is many people need to be prepared. It may not all be forgiven. And are they prepared for that difference to be a loan? Because the rules originally were four, max of 4%, max of 10 years. It's now two-year repayment at 1%. So you need to do that math on what piece of it, if it's not forgiven, how that will impact them to have us alone. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, the next question, are banks responsible for verifying the completeness and accuracy of the PPP forgiveness application? Banks are responsible for making the decisions. The way it reads right now is the bank, you submit to your bank and the bank will make the decision on forgiveness. Based on all of my experience with SBA, all of my experience with this program, that will work to the first time it doesn't work. <laughs> And then we will have SBA and Treasury step in with the big guns and dictate the way it's going to get done, just the way the disbursements went out. 
uh, the assumption was that the banks were going to do the right thing and get it to all the small businesses. Instead, they lined up some of their larger borrowers. Many of them got some significant um, backlash because they did that. So I think at this point, prepare it to go to your, your particular bank. And also the thing to keep in mind, you want to go back to your bank. I found banks that made mistakes in the calculation of the maximum loan. And some of the clients have already got the money when we discover the mistake the bank made. And it may be to their favor or not to their favor. So the best thing they have is document, document, go back, going back to that bank and saying, you did the math. Here's what it is. Here's what the application is. You help me figure this out. Going with all their information put together. Okay. Um, next question. I think, Marilyn, you touched on this uh, in, in your piece, but if you could just mention it again. Um, looking at the new rules, it says overtime is not included. Does that mean overtime is not covered by loan forgiveness? This is no. No, overtime is forgiven. The problem is that cal the separate calculation you do, have you reduced your full-time equivalents? All right. So if you've paid overtime, that's great. Not a problem. That's forgiven. But when you go into, and so if you have kept your, so you started out with 100 full-time equivalents and you've ended with 100 full-time equivalents and all those folks got paid overtime, great, no problem, you're fine. The only time you will have trouble is, is if you started with 100 full-time equivalents and when you do the math, you're down to 90 and you wished you could include the overtime that Tom did filling in for Susie and everybody else did putting in extra time but because you're required to do it. And that's something that might get changed by regulation. It's the regulation that set that. Because the reality is most businesses, the way they run, and in, in a crisis, if you're short, somebody else fills in. That's just what you do until you can find another body to work those 40 hours. Or if you have somebody who has extra needs because their, their spouse got laid off, hey, I'll work extra hours. Don't hire that extra person. I'll fill in and do that work. That's the way small business works. So I think they will find that capping it at one is not a good measure for small business. And I'm hoping that's one of the changes we'll see coming in the regulation. But for now, because they're capping it at one, there is no other way in the application to factor that in only on the full-time equivalent. As far as in the pay, if you meet that test, yeah, you're fine to pay it. Okay. Uh, the next question is talking about um, difficulty getting employees back due to enhanced unemployment. How is that going to affect PPP loan forgiveness if employees refuse to come back? Well, it just means that there's less employees and then you have everybody else work overtime and then you don't have the number of full-time right. equivalents because of the silly calculation. You're, you're doing you your best to keep employees employed. You're using the, maybe the same amount of hours that you had, but mm -hmm. you just the, the calculation doesn't result in your having enough full-time equivalents. And they do permit, Molly, that if you have made a formal written offer, email, for the same job, and that party in writing refuses the job, then you can exclude them from that calculation of the full-time equivalent uh, because you're not going to be penalized because they're refusing to come back. As right. Key said, you still got a whole host of other personnel issues you have to deal with. And that may or may not help you meet that full-time equivalent and all those other calculations, but you do get to exclude them from that calculation of the full-time equivalent. Yeah there's, body been, count. yeah, there's been a number of uh, situations where the employees have just not wanted to say anything in writing. They just don't respond to your request to verify in writing that they're turning down, new, uh, turning down the job. And I think part of it, don't you, Keith, part of it's going to be education on the part of the employees. So I've seen some employees that are terrified to go back because they work in a public environment. They're afraid to go back because of underlying health issues and they don't understand the Family Leave Act where they could. So as employers understand that and can explain it to their employee, the employee will turn it down for the right reason. I'm turning it down because I don't want to be in a public position, not because I just don't want to come back. I, th I think we've got time to take two more questions and then we'll... Um, um, end the webinar, but I, I do want to let you know, uh, there have been several questions about getting the slides, getting handouts that Marilyn referenced, um, uh, some of the information that Keith has referenced, and we will provide this to everybody after the call, um, and we will send along a recording of this webinar, so um, sometimes it takes a minute to get that all downloaded and, and put together, but we will send it out, so if, if you can just give us, um, you know, tell, you know, first thing tomorrow morning, we'll make sure that you have all that information handy. So um, back to um, the last two questions. Um, how do you determine loan forgiveness for a single member LLC with no employees? That is, how do you calculate forgiveness if you're self-employed? I understand. And the same way you did with the application, it's actually the most straightforward. You took whatever the bottom line, you looked at your Schedule C, bottom line, line 31, which is your net income, 
and you were to divide that by 12 times two and a half or 10, so you have 10 weeks that you were granted. You only give them forgiveness for eight, so that's your first math problem. So if you have no other valid ex, uh, ex, uh, expenses, you're gonna only wanna pay yourself eight to be forgiven. And what you will do is show that you have written checks to yourself. Now, some small businesses routinely don't spend their profit because they need to invest in it to grow their company, but this was the mechanism that was chose to give them their money. So write checks to themselves, and if at the end of the day they get a couple months out and they've got to loan that money back to the company, that's fine. But that's the way you're going to document that the money went out to you for eight weeks. Uh, you can't pay yourself 10 and be forgiven. You only get eight weeks of protection. And that's very specific in the regs that there's only eight weeks covered. Okay, great. Uh, then the le next and, and last question is, if a business has not been allowed to open yet, but have received PPP funds, are they okay to wait to start paying payroll when they reopen? They can wait as long as they want, but the forgiveness period starts at disbursement. So when the bank deposited that loan proceeds into their bank account, the eight weeks started. So if they sit on it for eight weeks waiting to open, they're never gonna meet the test for payroll. So that's the big issue. Many companies are sitting on it because it goes against the entrepreneur's DNA. We are all, if somebody works, they get paid. And when they don't work, they don't get paid. And it's really hard for the thought that take, if they're not working, they're on unemployment. What do you mean they're not working and on my payroll? That's just been really hard for businesses to digest. So some of them have been sitting on it and they're gonna have a great deal of difficulty meeting the forgiveness requirement. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add the, uh, the, the, the key thing, right, you can't forgive money you didn't spend. And I, I, I think there's some confusion out there so I wanna to clarify too. The June 30th piece, you, you, if you rehire the same number of staff by that June 30th, then there's no reduction in, the, in your maximum amount of forgiveness that you could apply for and get if you actually spent that much money. But if you didn't hire people back and you didn't spend money on them, you can't get forgiveness for money you didn't spend, even if you hire by that by June 30th. So that's a really important point. And as the safe harbor gives you room that if you're a couple employees short and you manage to get them in in weeks 10, 11, and 12, but if you haven't spent any, if they're sitting on it, they probably have lost their chance to apply for the forgiveness uh, and get it. Now, that doesn't mean that they may not want to keep, use the money for legitimate business purposes and pay it back over a loan. We kept waiting for the forgiveness application to have some penalty phase in it. If you're not forgiven, there's some penalty. So far, have not seen that. Nothing's come out about anything terrible is going to happen to you if you don't have all your funds forgiven. So that's something else to think about if and when we see it. Great. Well, be, before we close, I, I just want to turn back to, um, to Keith, Marilyn, Todd. Any, any closing comments you'd like to make? I have one. I see this and I've been telling all my clients on this from the very beginning. Don't try to force yourself into a program if it doesn't fit for you. First, figure out what you need. What's your landscape going to look like? Where am I need to spend my money when I go back into this new economy? And how am I going to grow? And if the program doesn't work, give the money back and find a better way to run your company. If it works, great. Use it. And I'd say don't think that you're alone and uh, don't try to do things on your own. Uh, NSBA has great resources. The affiliates of NSBA and in, in the various regions of the country have uh, great resources that can help you figure out what you need to do to uh, reopen smoothly and keep your employees happy and avoid getting sued by your customers and employees. And the last thing I have to add is, is really to think about, you know, how you're, what, what are these changes you made to your business you, you want to keep um, and which are compromises you've had to make uh, that you want to get past because uh, I really think it's important for companies to make sure they've used this period productively, not just to, to think about it as, as a lost period, but as a time when you might have retooled your company and created a new vision for the future. So um, uh, don't get too bogged down in the details of, of today. Think about how you're using this to move ahead and for the next six months to a year. Great. 
Thanks, Todd, Keith, and Marilyn. I, th I think your insight has been really helpful. And to everybody who's on the line still, we will be doing our best to answer all of the questions that you sent in. I know there's still a lot of confusion out there, but um, I, I do appreciate you, you sending those questions. And like I said, we will try and respond to those uh, following the webinar. Um, so again, we will be posting a webcast of this webinar later today, um, at least by tomorrow morning at the latest. Um, but please also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at NSBA Advocate. Uh, and we also have a, a microsite dedicated to COVID resources. So check out our website, nsba.biz slash COVID-19. Um, we know this is an incredibly difficult time you're facing now, and uh, we want you to know that we're in this fight with you. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks. Everybody. Right.